They've had a terrible day and they sit around the conference room and they're all having a chat and they turn to Iron Man and Iron goes, Iron Man says, yeah, but I still look good in the suit, don't I? Uh, 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 fantastic uh, I, can even, I can even do a little uh, do you want a little rim shot for that one <laughs> right, there we go there we go, we go. So. but but yeah. he still doesn't have Captain America's ass that's America's ass oh who, who? he oh, doesn't I know Eric either of them <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I like it I like it I like it a lot brilliant <laughs> Nice. Oh, look, look at this. Look at this. I've got a new mug. I might ah. look like I'm listening, but in my head, I'm playing guitar and I'm thinking about buying nice. another one. Yeah. Yeah. That was a gift from somebody that I met on LinkedIn. Actually. Oh, that's lovely. That's absolutely lovely, isn't it? It is very nice indeed. Yes. It's amazing, isn't it? How, um, how you can you can form friendships as well as business relationships with people that you meet in this online world that is um, the world that we inhabit. Yeah, it is. It is. It's fascinating. That. I had a I had a, a lovely morning. I met with a, a digital connection. Um, I met this person on a on a live show that I do, uh, an industry live show. We formed a bit of a relationship. We've exchanged some some DMs and things like that. Today we decided to meet for a cup of coffee, and when we met, we picked off li like we were. I'm not going to say like we were. We are friends, but it was like two old friends meeting, and we've never actually met. It was wonderful. Nice. Yeah, and we just sort of, it was like uh, Ken. Is it Ken Robinson, the TED Talker? Nice segue. Um, when it when he comes back something like eight years later and says, "So as I was saying." <laughs> yeah. yeah just carried on talking fantastic but uh, i think it was brian fanzo tim tim told me this quote brian fanzo said uh social media turns the first handshake into a hug and yeah. actually that, that's really true because when i went up to uh <coughs> aberdeen to see some some bloke give a ted talk i seem to remember it was <laughs> uh i met loads of people there that i had met uh, in in this virtual world uh, and i hugged them all because I felt like I really knew them. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, that's a nice, a nice comment there. It's nice to, it's nice to pay tribute that Dave K put in there. Wilco, Wilco Johnson, famous um, uh, member of Doctor Feelgood, and then went on to do his own work as well. Sadly passed. So there's lovely tributes on social media to him today, and his guitar playing style and all of that, which he kind of invented a particular style. And uh, yeah. Nice one. Yeah, I, I've invented a, a particular style as well. It's just not one that's n normally fondly remembered. Not not one that's normally fond fondly no. remembered at all. At all. No. At all. So, uh, welcome to the digital download and welcome to everybody <coughs> in the audience. Good afternoon, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Ross. Good afternoon, everybody else that, <coughs> that is watching. And uh, to, today, I think we're going to be a little bit more relaxed about things, aren't we? Because it's just us. We haven't got a guest today. Uh, <gasps> But we are, well, maybe that makes it more highbrow rather than yeah. less highbrow. Yeah. Um, no, probably not, actually. Um, so today uh, we're talking about storytelling. Uh, and, and I think that for all of us, um, I don't just mean all of us on the call. I mean, uh, all of us in, in the virtual world, uh, the idea of being able to tell stories is increasingly important. Uh, you know, the... the trying to create content that engages engages our audiences is really important and i think that, that one of the things that we often uh forget maybe is that the people that we are connected to and the people that are consuming our content are not in the same place as us so you know we are all in our own little little sphere and uh and it means that we don't need to tell stories amongst ourselves particularly you know, we can just reel out facts and we'll go, oh, that's really interesting. Um, but the world, the internet, is awash with facts. Yep. You know, it was uh, Eric Schmidt that said, Eric Schmidt, ex-CEO of Google and now of Alphabet Group, said um, there's more data now created in any 48-hour window than there was from the beginning of recorded history through to 2003. And it's probably through to 2010 or something now. Mm -hmm. Um and the point is that we've got loads of data, we've got loads of information, we've got loads of stuff. What we need is, as Gary V said, uh, content is king, but context is God. 
So how are we going to present this in such a way that people consume it, people believe it, people like it, people invest time in in uh, in consuming that content? Because surely one of the things that storytelling does is it enables you to engage your audience for a longer period of time than simply writing a series of facts. Now, I think it's worth saying that that uh, storytelling is a is a very human trait, isn't it? You know, from the oh, yeah. beginning of civilization, people were uh, around campfires telling stories. That's how stuff was passed from one generation to the next. Um, uh, music is largely based, or certainly used to be largely based until Oasis came along, largely based <laughs> on telling stories and communicating things. Uh, and certainly folk music was about educating and spreading the word amongst people that were largely illiterate. So, you know, you learn a folk song that can be passed down from generation to generation to generation. Um, or, or, or in the case of the Beatles, you just you just um, tell a story that you've heard someone else tell and, <laughs> and, and do it in a kind of slightly different way. Very true, but yeah. better <laughs> and, and more innovative. Uh, but but that's, that's a story for another show, yeah. uh, isn't it? Another show. I think this is an interesting point, though, for the show, because I think sometimes people assume that storytelling has to be brand new. And really, at the end of the day, there's a handful of stories. It's just the unique interpretations of the story, right? Like a story has a hero, the protagonist, right? The protagonist usually goes through some kind of journey. And then at the end, the protagonist wins the journey. <laughs> It's like pretty bait, like storytelling in its essence, like in its pieces is actually pretty basic. It's just how do we use the mechanism? And when, when you when you when you finished your little explanation of that, I, I felt compelled to stand on a rock and start singing the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, uh, very good. Uh, it, it, it is it is interesting, isn't it, that um, I don't know about you, but since we decided we were going to cover this topic and just have a chat about this topic this week, uh, I've been particularly focused on finding stories on the different social networks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, normally, I guess that that and perhaps I'm, I'm not normal from this perspective, but I normally consume content from people that I consume content from people that I like, people that I know, people that I've met. I read this content and I. I'm prepared to extend them a greater level of courtesy and attention than I might somebody that I don't know. So, you know, one of you guys publishes something, I read it, and I read it because it's you rather than because it's necessarily telling a good story. So I've been much more pragmatic about trying to identify whether or not the stories or the things that I'm seeing on social and posts uh, have been good stories. And it's amazed me how few people know how to tell a story. Correct. Absolutely amazed me. You know, so often it is all, yeah. <laughs> no, but so often it's just 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 bland statements of fact without any supporting evidence. So, you know, you need to do this because this is the quickest way to achieve this. Yeah. And you know, why, how? Prove I, it. I, what, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there, there, there is very rarely any of that. And the other thing that, that struck me is that and a friend of uh, a friend of ours uh, did a post earlier today, actually, and uh, they uh, they highlighted Brompton bicycles and uh, the, the headline was uh, Brompton make bikes that fold in under 20 second. That's the facts. The mm -hmm. story is Brompton create urban freedom for happier lives. Facts tell stories sell and facts tell stories sell is true, but that that isn't telling a story. You know, it's nope. a nice strap line. But how many people tell stories in their posts? Well, and I think maybe a good starting point here is uh, we have two exceptionally talented storytellers on this very. Oh, board. thank you. Robin <laughs> Let's hear it. Uh, yeah, but, but, uh, but you know, the, the whole TED process is one of teaching you how to tell stories from what I understand. So go on. Uh, oh, look, there we are. There's a prime example. There's somebody that I hugged first time I met her. Absolutely. Having interacted with her yeah, brilliant. On, on social. I met Beth. I gave her a hug. I felt like I was old friends with her. And uh, we, we, we too had a hug. Uh, I too had a hug with Beth, but she had to get a stepladder and I had to bend down. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, a little bit of a disparity in height. A little bit of a disparity in height. Because yeah. because she's eight foot three and you're only four foot two, aren't you? Right. 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 Uh, despite what people might might believe. Uh, how you tell a story matters as much as the story itself, if not more. Any Agreed. thoughts? Agreed. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So uh, uh, you you two you two Tedsters, uh, give us a little bit of background on uh, what you have learned about storytelling, or or what what. Uh, aha moments you had during the process of learning to deliver a TED talk? First Madame off, is Morrison, TEDsters a thing? Because I want to put it on my LinkedIn profile. Tedster. I'm a Tedster, <laughs> yeah. do it, do it. Tracy, I think you should, you should definitely grab this one. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was stuck on TEDster. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what aha moments did you have as you were going through the process of learning to, to be a TEDster? What aha moments when you thought, uh, yeah, of course, I never thought about that. That that people can kind of take away as as things that they can start to fold into their behaviors. So it was really interesting for me because by nature I am like an ad hoc speaker. I've been a Toastmaster for years, but I've never like written a speech. I had never written a speech before I did my TED talk. And because they make you, they make you write it out. Right. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna actually have to, to do that. And I never, I legitimately never had done that before. Started public speaking in university, right? So the whole time I had never done that. And it was really interesting from that perspective of bang intro, right? You're trying to capture people's attention right away. You're trying to create a story that makes sense because let's be honest, I talk on a lot of tangents as well. So sometimes it's hard for people to follow. So I had to tell a story that made sense and then leave it with a bam at the end, right? Like, what are you going to, like, what are people taking away? And it was a lot more structured for me than I've normally done. And it was a lot more structured than I'm normally comfortable with. But what it taught me was that there is this, I don't know. When I think of storytelling, I always think of Star Wars. I don't know. I'm a nerd. What are you going to do? But like the journey of Luke Skywalker is like the hero's journey. <laughs> I know. I know we have this in common here. Maybe this is what makes you a good Tedster. <laughs> sure, <Star Wars. laughs> Tedster. Um, but so for me, that's what I was like. Okay, we'll I have 14 minutes max to tell this whole story that took Star Wars three episodes at least to tell right um so that was the one thing was the structure and how it is important to have a good structure in your story because you want to leave people with something but more importantly you want to take the reader or the listener and put them in the shoes of the hero of the story and that's the activity right so when you're developing this talk and you have only 14 minutes to make an impact how are you going to take the audience and put them into the shoes of the hero? And the activity is the same with a social media post, right? It's a, it's a much shorter piece of content, of course, but how can you take somebody and put them in the shoes of the hero? So when they leave, they feel like the hero of the story, not that you're the hero of the story. So that was one thing that was really um, useful for me. And the other thing, those of you who know me, you know that I talk pretty fast in general. I have lots of ideas. I try to get them out of my mouth. Um, pacing is a thing that Ted is very strict on. <laughs> they, they're about teaching you how to pace so that you don't, I had a client once actually tell me that like the Tracy train was rushing by him and he couldn't get on. <laughs> And I'm like, well, story's no good if you, it just like blows by you like a bullet train and you can't put yourself in the shoes of the hero. And so that pacing was something that I'm still not super good at, but it's a very important piece of specifically verbal storytelling so that people can be with you as you tell the story instead of feeling like they're trying to catch you. Um, nobody likes to feel like someone is ahead of them and they're trying to catch up people like to feel like you're going somewhere together and that is something that really good pacing can do so those are probably the two biggest takeaways for me so, so the, the first of those takeaways about creating a story in which 
the reader is the hero and they can empathize with the hero and then they can be the star of the story. So how do you do that in your typical social media post? You know, so you've got 250 words to write some stuff and your boss is getting on your back about the fact that you haven't had enough views or you haven't sold enough stuff. So, you know, it, it so often, too often, invariably, it defaults into some sort of either overt or covert sales pitch. You know, it becomes a, uh, once upon a time, uh, this was the case until this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, so buy our stuff. You know, and that's basically what the post turns out like for most people. So, so how do you not fall into that trap? What advice would you give? The number one question I think is useful to ask in this scenario is why are we writing a post? <laughs> are we writing a post to write a post? Or are we writing a post to tell a story? Because in essence, storytelling isn't just Sure, I can. I remember when I was in corporate and we had to have a social media post every day and half the time people were just like taking someone else's content or someone else's quote and using that to fill the gap. Right? Yep. And you're like, that's our intention isn't to tell a story. But in my experience, it's also very rare that people have clarity on the story they want to tell, especially from a corporate perspective, right? So we have a product, we sell a product, right? And that becomes the story we tell because from a marketing perspective, we're bombarded with all of this information about getting views and advertising and all of these things. And we're not, we've never even tried <laughs> to tell a story, right? What is the story that our product tells? What, why does our product exist in the market? These types of why questions, most people aren't exploring on a day-to-day -day basis in the corporate work environment. I worked in marketing. I can, I can vouch for this. <laughs> right? It's our job to market the product. Never did we talk about storytelling. We went to one story brand workshop and then like used the story brand script on the homepage and that was it, right? Like we checked the box, we're doing storytelling, but we're not doing storytelling because the people <coughs> who are responsible for the content didn't know the story. And so I don't have a like super good answer because really what you need to do is you need to go and learn the story. And you also need to go and understand what is your voice in the story. So as a marketing coordinator or as a marketing manager or as a salesperson, what is your role in the story of the business? Because once you know your story, then you can tell your story. But until you don't, until you know your story, are just going to say facts because that's what you know. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, that's really, uh, that's really good advice. As a pragmatist, how does somebody make that happen? By, know, under, by understanding the science. Right. By understanding the science. This whole stuff about storytelling in business, to some, sounds a little bit fluffy. Mm. Until you realize what we're actually talking about is fundamental, crucial science. And it's rooted. All you have to do is watch Start With Why with Simon Sinek to get a, a little taster of this, but then pull it through even further. We are wired as humans pretty much the same way. Our newest brains, our neocortex right at the front, operates at the what level. That's what functions and processes rational and an analytical thought and language, right? It can consume vast amounts of data and take on vast amounts of information. The limbic brains in the middle of our, 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 our brain area is responsible for all of the feelings around, uh, for feelings like trust and loyalty, and they tune into why. The limbic brains are also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and has absolutely no capacity for language. When we communicate with the what, people can understand vast amounts of information, facts and data, features, benefits, and all of that. It just doesn't drive behavior because it scientifically can't. When we communicate from the why, which is the storytelling part, and then move into the how and the what, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then if we supplement that with a couple of little um, neocortex stimulators, we allow people to rationalize the tangible things that we're saying and doing. So therefore they leave that room or they leave that post walking away with a behavioral change mindset and also some information. And they're able to change their behavior. Okay, I, I get that, but I, 
I I struggle with the the difference between the abstract concept mm -hmm. and the concrete implementation. So I, I, I understood every word you said in that, but that doesn't <clears> help me. You know, I understood exactly what you said, but I don't understand how I take that and do something with that. Let's go back to let's go back to Simon Simon Sinek once uh, just once again. Um, he famously opened one of the best well known TED talks by saying by talking about why into how into what and start with why. When it back in the day when he was doing his thing, Apple were changing the world of computers and uh, most of the companies that sold computers at the times he gives the great example they say they they were all saying we make great computers they're well designed they're simple to use and friendly do you want to buy one that's how everyone in that sector communicated we we say what we have and what we do we tell you why that's better than what you currently have and we expect you to change behavior but you can't mm. so everyone's talking about the fact that we're globally focused innovative, technology-centered, client-focused, we're generous listeners, we are best in class, we're this, we're that, we're blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, Apple were changing the game. They were selling computers pretty much like Gateway and everybody else at the time, just with access to exactly the same stock resources and stuff and talent pools, but their message to the world was different. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in doing things differently. The way that we do that is by making our products beautiful, Simple to use and friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Do you want to buy one? <laughs> Selling exactly the same thing. Company A, Gateway, we make great computers. They're well designed, simple to use. You should have one. Apple created an experience. Apple were trying to affect the, the limbic part of the brain by making you want to be part of that community and making you want to be part of the gang rather than just a customer. So... Right. So I understand that. And I understand that with Apple, because Apple are clearly a very different company to other companies. You know, when you pick up one of their products, it's beautifully made. It's milled from a solid lump of metal as opposed to something which is two bits of plastic that are clipped together. You know, it's a very different product. And all of those words resonate with me. But I run an accountancy practice. Yeah. And my accountancy practice is doing, and, and the number of times that I have been approached on social media by accountants who say, uh, you know, we're an accountancy practice. Uh, we do basically all of those things that you don't want to do. So, you know, bookkeeping and tax returns and the yada, 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 and all of these things. Um, so do you want to have a talk? Well, no, because you do exactly the things that I'm already getting from somebody that I've known for 10 years. So why would I want to talk to you about them when you've just told me they're exactly the same things as them? So, so how do, do I, as an accountant, start to make use of that Simon Sinek start with what you, you do what you do what QuickBooks are doing all over the media right now. They're they've created something really fun and interesting, um, telling telling stories which reach out to the 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 limbic parts of the brain of their customers by talking around the subject and around their knowledge of the pinch points and pain and all of that. And right at the end. There's a little bit, and and you know that's what we're here for. But it's never. Do you want to buy accountancy services? Mm. It's it's building it's building a it's building a little community of fun and interest and a bit of entertainment around about the subject by talking about their knowledge of the kind of things that go on in the world around about what it is that they do, and then they offer a little glimpse into how how life could be better, how your position and how your daily bread could be better by offering a completely different approach. They're still selling accountancy services. Adam, it, it's as simple as the difference between you and me. When you give people facts and figures about what happens in the world, what happens to you, they listen, but they're not particularly interested. When you tell people a story, they naturally put themselves in the center of that story. They can envision this happening to them. We're all a bit egotistical like that. We are the star of our own personal journey. So telling them that story and allowing them to put themselves in it. So my question then would be, what are the stories your ideal customer profiles already telling themselves? Yeah, and how do you align your solution with that? I like that. Yes, I like that a lot. So, 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 so let's assume, if you will, that that um, 
there's a there's a marketing manager somewhere or of the 875 million people on LinkedIn. There's there's a marketing manager somewhere, and they've tuned in to an absolutely devastatingly interesting live stream on a Friday. Wow! And and, and let, 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 where? Let's, <laughs> let, let, What's the link? Let, let's imagine. Let's imagine that they're like Tracy. So they've 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 tuned into this because they're eager to kind of learn and discover things and have their thinking challenged. And they've they've said, right, that's it. That's where we're going wrong. That's why all of our campaigns are falling, you know, on, uh, on deaf ears. And every time we email out, we get loads of unsubscribes. And every time we have a go at, at, at cold calling people, they're not listening to us. And, and they're going through all of these processes that so many businesses are. But Tracy is sold on this idea. So she has to take it back to her business and get them to be equally passionate about. It. So, what does she do? What does she do to convince other people in the business to get on this this train? Can I speak from my own perspective because I've actually Please. done that? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what I did. Whether or not people, this is the right way. <laughs> this is a different thing. But I, so I, I went to a story brand uh, workshop, and I was like, oh. This is so awesome because the whole point is about like creating a story for people to go in. And I went back to the company and I started, I did two things. One, I started writing my blog posts because I had the freedom to write blog posts from a storytelling perspective instead and looked at the engagement from a storytelling blog versus a heavily facts laden blog, very much higher engagement on the storytelling blogs. I will tell you right now. Secondly, I rewrote the homepage of the website. I didn't publish it, but I rewrote it and I wrote it from a storytelling perspective. Like this is my interpretation of what the company does um, through a story. And then we had meetings about it and everything. So it ended up being like everybody's version, which I think is a like watered down version once everybody's opinions are included. But um, we ended up, it ended up kicking off an entire website redesign because they were like, oh, the company I worked for at the time is a tech company. Tech companies have the tendency to speak tech because that's mm. what they know. And they like to say like, these are all the things that we do and this is why this tech is better than this tech. And then then they're like, we have all this content. Now we'll just like SEO optimize, right? And you're like, we have like 40, 42 pages of content. <laughs> There was there were 42 pages on the website at that point. Um, we redid the website. So there were eight pages, um, not including like the like case studies and stuff like that, but eight primary pages on the website that were just based on telling the story of what the company does. So will that work out in every scenario for every middle line manager? Absolutely not, because depending on how open your organization is to innovation and trying new things, if, if you're in like a big global organization, maybe start with the blog post piece of it. Um, but there are ways to just like start doing it, right? If you're creating content today, like if you're already writing social media posts, write one, write a storytelling one. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, a, a friend of mine, who does a, another show with me on Wednesday is Passion Break. If there, of you there, there is another show, is there? Is that the I one do... <laughs> <laughs> I'm on all the shows, just in case anybody's watching. <laughs> I have three weekly shows. Um, anyway, so my my co-conspirator for Passion Break, Kira Day, she's currently in Costa Rica. Very rarely does she post on social media, besides the fact that we do Passion Break on Wednesdays. But she, Yesterday was U.S. Thanksgiving, although the both of us are Canadian. <laughs> but um, we did a topic this week about gratitude and passion. And so yesterday she posted this post of her next to this like giant tree in Costa Rica, making her look very tiny, although she, she is legitimately very tiny, um, about the conversation we had at Passion Break and what it made her start to think, right? So it's all just her perspective, right? It's just people who like, this is just my experience of the conversation we had. And people forget that storytelling can just be your story, right? Like it doesn't have to be something complex. It doesn't have to be something you create, right? Like it's not like you show up here and we're writing fiction, right? 
you can just tell a story about how you experienced. I tell a story all the time about how I experienced my son, right? Like, oh, this really mundane thing happened today, but this is my story of it. And other people are having that experience. So those types of things, just like Rob said, the, what they're already experiencing, what they're already thinking, people can get in the story. It's very easy access. So th this I, I do. Really, sorry, I was just, I was just going to say, yeah. this is a really interesting comment on that. How it, so Ross's uh, comment, how crucial is tone of voice in the storytelling process? Absolutely crucial. It's the difference between drawing your audience in and pushing them away. And, and it's the same for standing on a stage or writing a, a, a post. It's that tone of voice is absolutely crucial. Um, I think, I think one of the, one of the key sort of thunk moments that I had during, so we had a like 12, 14 week training process and prep process to get ready for TEDx Aberdeen a couple of weeks ago. Um, you the, only got 11 minutes, didn't you? So Tracy keeps going about 14 minutes. You must feel really <laughs> short changed. Well, actually, it's I, a I, currency I, exchange. Well, we had 12 minutes. But yeah. I went a bit over, famous, famously, a little bit over, and they're going to have to do a bit of editing. But one of the one of the, um, one of of the the thunk moments that I had, so we worked with the, the, the brilliant guys at AB15, Bob Keeler and uh, Derek Thompson, who took us through their business storytelling program, which was fascinating and has changed a hell of a lot about me and will change more to come. One of the things that came clear to me during this process was that I'd never really, I guess, I guess sort of tacitly I'd kind of given it some thought, but I'd never actually sat down and really absorbed this. There's a big difference between presenting and really connecting with people, really connecting with people. So this, this has changed. So going through that process with Bob and Derek has really made me think about, and, and actually it works digitally, it works in content and it works on a stage. Are you presenting? Now, at some points in our lives, we've all had to stand up and present. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I've got a few slides. It's a health and safety thing. We're changing the color of the fire extinguishers. They're going from green to red. Um, no longer use the green ones. Use the red ones. Just transferring information. Just presenting. Um, John or Joanne's going to give you out some forms to sign. They need to be in by Tuesday. Thanks very much. Any questions, give me a call. Five slides presented. Done. You're not really looking to make a super deep connection. You're just trying to exchange information and get that out there. So going from that mindset to that's fine. Do I need to present or do I need to connect is a fundamental building block for change. If you need to connect with people, if you need to, if you need to get inside people's heads to the point where you're going to change behaviors, you need to think about connecting. And that's where much deeper thought and skill comes into this. Um, you need to think about meeting people where they are and bringing them along on a sto and on a journey. Um, to truly connect with people, you need to understand, first off, it's exactly what Tracy said earlier on. What am I trying to achieve? Who am I trying to connect to? What do I want to connect with them on? What level do I want to connect with them on? Um, what do I want them to experience in this? And writing this all down. So this is all the part of the journey and the training that we got was, what do you want people to experience on this? One of the beautiful things that uh, the guys at AB15 showed us, I'd never heard of it before, was Pluchik's emotional wheel. Super, super helpful. Pluchik's emotional wheel. Often on this wheel, I, I should have brought it along, um, but I haven't. I, I don't have it. We can maybe put a, a little copy of it in the link. Pluchik's emotional wheel shows us that we we stay in, generally stay when we're presenting or we are traditionally presenting or writing content, we stay in sort of danger zones of emotion. But actually, if you use linkages on this emotional wheel, you can you can actually craft out where you're, where you're, your post, your pitch, your presentation, whatever you're calling it, or your connection that you're trying to make is actually taking people on this journey. The more spots you can hit, the more effective you're being and getting people to rise up with you, to come down with you, to start supporting you, to start feeling sad for you, happy for you, all these things really affecting those parts of the limbic brain, really affecting and getting all the behavioral change modes firing in there. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, I had a couple of like, uh, Bob used to keep saying to us, um, don't tell us, show us. Don't tell us, show us. Now, even that's pulling through to content for me, that's become really helpful. How do you, so, okay, I get what you're saying. Don't tell us, show us. Maybe I can show a small video at this point. Perfect. Or I can show a picture. That's great. We can't always do that with our content, but we can do it with text. We can actually show people a little bit more 
rather than just telling and just saying, you know, this is great, this is great, you should buy it. You, could, you can actually show it and demonstrate it through text, through an example, something that they're going to be able to relate to. Oh, look at that. Blue chick's wheel. Have a little look at that and watch that little slide on that. That is a fascinating little aid to where where am I? Where am I? Am I am I in the danger zones of of boredom? Am I, am I going to have people during this talk? Am I going to have people's heads nodding down and thinking? Actually, I'll just check in on LinkedIn and see if anybody's. Uh, how do you keep bobbing their heads up by taking them through these lovely little nodal points on this emotional wheel? And which ones do I want to go for? If I'm looking for ecstasy at one point if I want them all to be I, I want to play around serenity move into joy and then pull them into ecstasy if I want to move into into a bit of terror I want to play about with apprehension and fear and then hit them with a sucker punch of terror and then pull them back out start to get them into surprise and and distraction and all these and you can weave all of these elements into your pitch your post your your on stage presentation um one of the um, a, a couple of days after Ted, Bob wrote a great post, uh, and he spoke about the training program. We had eight group sessions, five online drop-in clinics, three one-to-one -one coaching sessions, multiple videos, and e-learning modules. We all put in for a for a for a twelve-minute talk. We all put in over forty hours of work. I personally put in about sixty hours of work um, for a twelve-minute talk. That sounds like a lot of effort, um, but it got results. That simple maxim applies to everything that we're doing in what we call public speaking, which I think is a horrible term, or presentations. Um, but he said so often we see, and we see this in content as well as people standing on stages, so often we see people, people finding something that kind of works with them a little bit, works for them a little bit because they feel comfortable for it, but it's ineffective. He calls it, number one, the fling and wing approach. Chuck a few slides together and wing it. Disastrous. Absolutely disastrous. This is from his post, reading text slides, promising, well, I won't go through all of these, and then going through them all. And yeah. then going through them all. And you can see everybody reaching it for them. It makes me laugh when somebody says, I'm not, you probably can't read this at the back. So what the hell have you put it on the screen for if you know the people <laughs> sitting in it can't read it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, know, you know what's funny is as I'm listening to you talk, Eric, I'm, I, it's amazing. And I'm thinking, so what is the commercial value of storytelling? What are the facts? <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait a minute, Alex. <laughs> Eric is telling a story and you're putting yourself in the center of it. Yeah, yeah that's brilliant, brilliant. Um, The next thing he said was standing at a podium, stiffly reading a script with polished corporate slides on the big screen behind you and everyone thinking, well, this could be a robot doing this or anybody. There's nothing about this person that's adding any value to this. And the last one, which, uh, which we see all the time, talking about themselves, their own organization's achievements and awards, instead of letting the audience know how you can properly help them and add value to their lives. So let me, first of all, let me just run through uh, a little bit about us. Like <laughs> That's enough about us. What do you um, think about us? <laughs> and then the, the last, yeah, yeah. That's enough about us. What do you think about us? And the last one, which is a bit of a, a bit of a revelation for me. I've, Throughout my life, I've thought I'm I'm pretty confident on the stage, um, and and I, and I kind of cringed when I heard him talk about this, uh, and when he put it in his post because everything's changed for me now on this. Over fifty hours of work, I reckon, for a twelve minute presentation that we we all put into that. Um, I've been guilty of thinking I like being on stage. I'm a bit cocky. I'm I'm not going to bother rehearsing because I I I'm just going to wing it. I'm just going to wing it. I know what I'm talking about. Um, so there's no structure there. There's no flow that Tracy talked about. There's no context. There's no turning point. There's no resolution. There's no call to action. There's just uh, a big, bold, brassy person standing on the stage just going off on tangents and everyone going, what is going on here? It's, it, I'm, I'm intrigued and it's quite entertaining, but I'm taking nothing from this. And we see this in, in content, we see it in presentations. The fling and wing approach I've seen many times in my life, chucking a few slides together and just going to wing it. Um, one, of the, one of the funniest, and, and it's, there you go, it stuck with me today, was a very, very droll and dry Scottish projects director standing up to talk about a huge project in Brazil. And he was the project director of this, a multi-billion dollar project. And he was presenting it at a kickoff meeting. And Neil stood up and he spoke very much like that throughout the entire thing. This is a picture of the project. This is a picture of the vessel. 
this is us at a client office. Uh, this is the office that we set up. So we went over there and it, this has stuck with me for life. I, I, I find it incredibly funny. It was the first time I'd seen someone do something with this confidence at a presentation. Was he a great presenter? No, but he did something great during it. He said, so we got over there, we set up the office, we hired some staff and, uh, and I'm just going to show you what happened. And the next slide, he's, he's flicked to a blank slide and he just stared at the audience for a good 20 seconds. Which is a lifetime, isn't it? A, in lifetime. That situation. a lifetime. And he went, that's right. Everybody's thinking, is, is the slide broken? Has he lost his place? And he went, that's right. What happened was absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing happened for six months. And I thought, there, there, you, there you go. There's a guy who's who's just been asked to give a presentation, but he's done something. I mean, that was that was probably 15 years ago, and I still remember that today. I still remember that little point. So so the not rehearsing part, I'm just going to give it a go. I know what I'm talking about. There's loads, loads to learn there. Um, for, for me, for me, just to, to, to close off on your initial question, you know, what learning, this is going to sound really, really, really fluffy and, and nonsense, but one of the things that I had throughout this entire process was I had a kind of clunk moment um, in a few of our classroom sessions. If this was, I don't know if this is going to translate to Boston and to Calgary, but you know what, you know what the Great British Bake Off is. You know what that is. Have you seen it? Um, sometimes a few of the a few of the bakers end up with a soggy bottom. You know, yeah. it's, got a, it's got a soggy bottom, or it's overbaked. A few of my homework sessions, where I, was, you know, went into present my homework, a few of them got a soggy bottom, got a, a dry hand clap. Um, but but one of the revelations that I had, which has changed everything about me, was um, stop trying to stop trying to stop trying to do this in a way that's trying to have pizzazz or have you know flair that you think other people want to see you do. Just feel it. Just feel this. Just ab take a deep breath. Have a think about what you're trying to get across. How can I? How can I put this across in an authentic way? So at that point, I decided, and I and I told uh, our our our, uh, our curator uh, Derek on a one to one call. I've had a revelation. I don't want to be a TED talker. I've been I'm be getting swept away, and I'm I'm becoming someone else in this process. I'm trying to. I'm watching TED talks, and I'm thinking, oh, that's a good thing to do. I'll do that. When actually, I just want to walk out there, take a deep breath and go, this is Eric. So as I was saying, <laughs> so as I, was saying I, I want you, if you meet me in the street or you see me on a live, like the digital download, to see the same person on that stage. And actually, if I do that, if I'm very genuine and very authentic, um, then I've got nothing to lose and I, I don't have to fake it. I'm not trying to be someone else. I'm not trying to be Mr. Educator or Mr call to action. I'm just going to share something with you the way I would speak to you in a bar, a cafe, or on a, or on a live like this, or in my content. And I want all that to link together beautifully because I'm going to wear clothes that I feel comfortable in, that you'll see me in walking around the town. I'm not going to go and buy a new outfit to look like Mr. Corporate Speaker. I just want to be me. And actually then everything became a lot easier because then I could feel it. And then I could start to engage people in a, in a process. So that was a major learning point was just, I think a lot of people I met, I met someone that the, the lady that I met this morning that I've known for, for said the idea of doing what you did and walking onto that red dot makes me want to be physically ill. I couldn't do it. And I said, I actually, I completely disagree. You can, it's not that you could, you can, you absolutely can. You've built up this whole idea of public speaking as being sort of things that other people do. Things that other people do, it's them. It's, the, it's those TED Talkers, that's what they do. When actually, um, you've built up so many fear walls around this and you've created them all yourself. What if people don't like what I say? What if people don't like the way that I stand? What if I fluff my lines? What if I blah, blah, blah? Because you're, you're trying to be, you've seen great talks. You've seen Steve Jobs. You've seen, I don't know if Elon Musk's great, but you've seen the big kickoff meetings. You've seen TED Talks. And you say, oh, these, those people are really good. Those people have had training and they've had help, and I, f I fundamentally believe I fundamentally believe that there's a, there's a there's a Teddy type talk in everyone with a bit of support and a bit of guidance to help them through that journey. So what you're saying is brilliant, but it's easier said than done. How Very much do so. how do you break down those walls that you've built up, for, probably over many years in some cases? 
I think I think um, at one of the one of the foundation blocks of how building breaking down those walls that you've built up is just exactly what we talk about with our clients. It's getting a process in place and actually understanding the biology, understanding the mechanics, the devices that you can use that are going to make you more comfortable as a speaker and are going to make more people more comfortable with you as a speaker. So information is power, right? So if you understand how all this works and you understand at this point, if I do this, then there's a sort of biological, psychological tenant there if I use if I use little devices, I can't remember the real. Is it triordials or triples? If I use little tri- little triples, if I if I uh, if I stand here and say, um, uh, you know, first of all we could go over there, or we could go over there, but then we could centralize and do it right here. There's a big difference in doing what is happening here. There's a big difference. Jupiter. It's a big difference. <laughs> yes, you're right. Less. It is Jupiter. Less now we all have Mercury. There's a big difference between doing that and saying we could go over here, or we could go over here, but we could centralize and do it right here. Tone of voice, hand movements, being comfortable, knowing that there's. I learned. I learned. I learned loads about body language and stagecraft, um, and when you know these points. They make you more comfortable as a speaker because you're not going out there to wing it. You're not going out there to just um, to just give it a go and see what happens. You're going out. You're going out, and, and this is a horrible thing to say. You're going out there with someone who's now got a bit of expertise in how this works. So you feel far more comfortable, and you've smashed through most of those walls because you're not going out there to wing it to see what happens. You're going out there. Little things, body language. Um, um, that I, I learned about the influence zone, the influence zone. Um, Someone standing with their hands by their side doing their thing or with their hands crossed down around the groin area is far less um, far less perceived as an influencer or someone who has influence or authority than someone who comes out, opens up their shoulders a little bit and holds their hands just above the belly button. Psychologically, that person is more in charge. And if you keep your hands above the belly button while you're doing it and keep your shoulders back and then emphasize certain words with a little hand movement out to the left, a little hand movement out to the right. If you're using these little triples, you know, more, better, faster and emphasizing them with hand points. Again, ah, that's the word. A trickle on. He has been listening. <laughs> Has been listening along the way. It's because he didn't say anything bad, then, isn't it? And it's his fault. Yes, yeah, uh, it, he caused all of this. So, so in answer to that, how do you get someone to the point where they are they are not terrified about all those walls? Great question, Alex. And I think a huge part of it is to understand the process, understand the devices that you can use, and have a framework that you can use to apply to anything: your content, a stage talk, or a pitch, or whatever it might be. Thank you, Derek. The gaffer is in the room. Can I add one other thing there too? Because I, a lot of times it's hard to just make the switch. So like Adam was talking about at the beginning, if I'm going to go from posting corporate brochure where today to storytelling tomorrow, what are the things that I can do? And I don't think any of us have done that. <laughs> Right? So instead of assuming that we can do that, it's about taking little steps, right? I remember... Yeah. I've done a lot of Dale Carnegie training, right? And they make you do homework, right? The, the TED experience makes you do homework. Yep. And unless, like, most of us aren't just going to sit around by ourselves and do homework that nobody assigned for us. No. Right? No. No. <laughs> and so if having those, and you can create them for yourself, but really having those external forces that are like, okay, now try this. This is why people do like 30 day video challenges and things like that as well. Right. Cause it's someone else holding you accountable to trying a thing. Yeah. And like, I had a similar experience in Dale Carnegie, right? Like you have to come and you have to do a talk every time and mm-hmm. you have to do them based on emotional events and you have to do them based on things you're teaching and it teaches you different parts of the equation. Toastmasters does the same thing, right? And if you, if you don't have that, I think it makes it easier to have a little bit of that external, like, 100%. One hundred, one hundred percent. Um, a lot of people. I've now realised that, um, all the way through my professional life, I've, I've, I've been kind of winging it based on personality, personality, personality will get me through. Um, when in actual fact, 
what I now realize is that there are devices and processes that I can use that will add credibility, competence, and and a comfort level. So I started thinking, I need, what do I want to do? And Derek on our one-to-ones was like, what, it, what, what, what emotions do you want to get out of this and where do you want to start? And I said, what I want to start is when I come out onto the red dot, I want people to feel comfortable that this guy's comfortable. If I'm comfortable and I look comfortable and I've got a smile and I take a deep breath and just a look around, I want them to feel we're in good hands here. I want to start with a bit of self-deprecation because I think that always works well, you know, and yet again, I find myself out of my depth, you know, so this guy's not just going to ramble on about how brilliant he is. He's actually talking that he's got failures and then I'm going to build from there. I want to take them through a journey of tragedy and loss. I want to take them through um, uh, adventure. I want, to, I want them to smell the, the region and taste the region and feel it with me. I want them to feel the heat. I want, them, I want them to feel the pain of what I went through and then the abject failure and then the build back to the success and what success meant. I want to take them through that emotional journey. We can do this in our content online. We okay, can do so this on that point. On hmm? that point. So um, your content has a beginning, a middle and an end. Yep. Uh, so... How can somebody break their content down so that it doesn't just become a bear? You know, a little bit of a stream of consciousness. Uh, I bumped into Eric today, and you never guess what? He was wearing a red shirt, and he was wearing a red shirt last time I saw him. And actually, it was wearing his boots last time I saw him because he was wearing red boots as well. And he was on a red dot, so everything was a bit red. The end. You know, it's like, okay, that, that's lovely in as much as it puts somebody else in in my shoes for for having that interaction or that that experience but it's it hasn't added value it hasn't taken people on a journey it hasn't told them a story it hasn't got a, a beginning a middle and an end so what are the, some of the techniques they can use to start to package up some of their thinking in a way that is going to encourage the reader or the watcher if they do a video to go through that journey with them start with intentionality <coughs> Yeah, what do I you think... want to say and, and what do you want them to hear? Go ahead. Trish. I always go by this formula and I, I don't know where I heard it. It's not my own formula, but like, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> Journalism 101. <laughs> and it doesn't like, and here's the thing about social media too, in particular, right? Like people do scroll, right? People either are engaged by the first sentence or an image that you use or they're not and they're going to scroll past it right so if you make your point too far down in a post most people won't get there right so i think that tell them what you're going to tell them <laughs> and you don't have to t you can't tell them all things in one sentence right that's that's not how a story works but like what do they need to know to convince them they need to listen to the rest of the story and then yeah. tell them the story and then tell them what you want them to take away or what you want them to do. Right. Like what do you, I, I love a good, what if, right. So like do like, what if Wednesday is a lot of times and like at the end, it's like, what if this, that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what if, right. Yeah. Um, and so that ties back to Rob's intention piece. Like, and I, and I kind of think it ties back to the whole why concept too, right? Like, why are you writing this post? Why are you writing this post about why Eric is wearing the red shirt and that was on the red dot and everything's so red? <laughs> so I, I, I think that this is a this is a really important thing that Kevin said. Um, and you know, we often say to people when we're working with them that that they need to have confidence you know they need to lead with themselves it's the most attractive thing they've got and one one of the things that i've noticed and you may have noticed this or or maybe it's not true but i have noticed that some of the people that seem to be being pushed as content creators stroke influencers are becoming increasingly formulaic with their content yeah and as a result of that the content is getting progressively less engagement from the audience than it used to get. Yep. And I think that part of that is that they are, they are being forced into this formulaic thing. And, you know, one of the, you know, so you highlighted, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, you highlighted Simon Sinek, you highlighted, uh, Eric, this is, you highlighted Steve Jobs, uh, 
the thing that is special about all three of those is that they didn't go into that box. You know, what yeah. they did was they had a very different way of doing it. So uh, Steve Jobs and his, oh, and one more thing, you know, for the big reveal, or when he was addressing uh, uh, Stanford at the commencement speech, you know, where he wrote it, literally wrote it the night before because the guy that was going to write it for him kept saying, I'll write it for you, I'll write it for you. And then he said, no, you need to write it yourself. You're the one they want to hear, not me. And he did that Aye. the night before. Uh, and uh, and Simon Sinek, you know, with his flow chart, where uh, his flip chart, where he's getting so so animated and he's drawing these lines on it, and he's going, you know, and an arrow here and 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 it's that, it's that the the themness, you know, you you got to see the most authentic snippet of who they were, didn't you, in those talks? Yeah, they dropped the guard, they dropped the corporate nonsense, they dropped the feeling that I need to give a great talk here. They just went out there, you know. I have to, I have to. Um, preface this by saying that their version of themselves was worth listening to and I mean that with love and tenderness that just telling people to be themselves isn't all, always the answer No, it just so happened that lots of people who have done great work in public who went out there and, and, and were themselves, their version of themselves was actually worth listening to that's not going to work for everyone uh, hmm I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I agree with that. But I, I, don't, I, I mean, being yourself is fantastic the whole time, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody just being themselves can just jump on a stage and just give a brilliant talk. No, it isn't. And, and what it doesn't mean is that everybody will love you because not everybody loves you in real life. And if you're authentic in your posts and your talks, not everybody's going to love you there as well. But actually, therein lies the beauty of this. Yeah. You know, if if you say to somebody, I'm really good at these things, but I'm really crap at these things. So if these are what you want, I ain't your man. <laughs> now, now that that's lovely, because actually what future is there for you to have any sort of relationship, either business or romantic or friendship with somebody who values the things that you are not good at? Whereas if you can find somebody that says, yeah, those things that you're rubbish at, I don't care. They don't matter to me. These are what matter to me. Mm. That's perfect for a business relationship. It's perfect for a partnership because you want somebody that says, well, those things that you're good at, I hate those. These bits that you hate, I love. I love Great. Well, you know, there's no argument about who's going to do what in this relationship. <laughs> and those love people them. are out there. You know, the clients are out there that say, I'm buying you for this little niche here. Mm -hmm. and And that kind of forthrightness of being the most authentic who you are, the good and the bad, you know, the little peculiarities that we all have, leading with those draws to you people that value the things that you're good at and you like. I think this is true. And one of the things that I also, storytelling doesn't have to be standing on a TED stage, right? Exactly. Not everyone is going to stand on a TED stage. Not everybody wants to stand on a TED stage. It was actually really interesting for me because one of the things that I have learned in my journey through public speaking is that I don't like being at the front of the stage like I'm the one everyone should listen to. I like being in a conversation, right? So like, and that's my preference. That's not everybody's preference, but everybody has a different preference. So using the power of storytelling isn't about trying to get someone to do something on social media or about being on a TED stage, there is a power in telling a story that gives people access to your experience, which is the door that allows them to step into that experience. So whether it's you meeting someone at a coffee shop and having a random conversation, or it's a social media post, or it's a TED talk, or it's in a client presentation because your client really needs to understand this. Right. The power of storytelling is the same power. It's the same power I have in convincing my son to eat vegetables. Right. Like there's no end to the value that storytelling has. And so all of us, everybody in the chat today, all of us on this call, everybody who's listening to this on a replay has a different way they are going to storytell. All of the, the pieces that we were talking about, the strategies, the formulas, those things, there's, yes, they exist. And there's a way for you to do that in your way. And when you can find your way, that's when storytelling will become powerful for you. And that 
is an exploration, right? If you're not using storytelling today, there's some things you can try. <laughs> and I, I just encourage everyone the, to try them. <laughs> I think that's the mic drop moment. Yeah, I was just that's thinking. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. As Kevin, as Kevin said, um, it's yeah. not all about TED Talks. It's not all about posting. It's um, meeting someone in the in a coffee shop. It's about pitching an idea to an investor or a new client. It's about everything. It's about how we are communicating ourselves out in our business and our domestic lives. Mm. And, and next week, it would be great to hear uh, Tracy's story about how she can actually get her son to eat his vegetables. Yeah, because your, your sure. kids are like in their, in their like uh, pushing, pushing their thirties, and you still can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's be honest; it's specific vegetables, but the kid does eat vegetables, so I'll take it as a win. Very good. That was a lovely hour. It was so. Uh, Thank you to everybody for your questions. What fantastic interaction from the audience this week. <coughs> Absolutely brilliant. Oh, it was lovely. Yeah, and fantastic. Thank you for, from everybody on the panel. Uh, we haven't introduced ourselves. We don't need to introduce ourselves. Everyone knows who we are because we're here every bleeding week, aren't we? So, uh, <laughs> we're famous. We're LinkedIn famous. <laughs> we are. So everybody, thank you all very much indeed.